Welcome to Blackbird Writers Presents Author Interviews. I'm Tracy Phillips, and today I'm talking with Karen Odin. She is the author of three standalone Victorian mysteries and two Inspector Michael Coravan novels. She has contributed essays to many books and journals and has written introductions for Barnes and Noble's classic series. She served as an assistant editor for the Academic Journal of Victorian Literature and Culture. She also offers workshops on the craft of writing and the writing life and is currently serving as the publicity liaison on the National Board of Directors of Sisters in Crime. She is a transplant from New York City and now lives in Arizona with her family, where she loves to hike the desert under the big blue bowl of the sky. Welcome, Karen Odin. Thank it's you so, so great. much. It's lovely yeah. to be here. It's so great to talk to you. I'm so excited to talk about your historical fiction. Um, I, I, I don't know why I'm like so drawn to historical fiction for some reason, especially lately, and I don't know but I, I just love it. And your characters are great. And your settings are so, I they just like suck you right in and put you right there, you know? I love that. It's the nicest thing. I love hearing that. <laughs> yeah. Um. So what got you interested in writing about the 19th century? Well, it's it's my favorite question. It's it's kind of like where, where every author begins, right? So back in... 2001, I finished my PhD work at New York University. I was doing a, I was doing my PhD in English. And I had, I, when I, be, when I got to NYU, I was interested in the Victorian period, just mostly because I liked Charles Dickens and Anthony Trollope. And um, I was very lucky that NYU had this deep bench of Victorian talent. We had four professors. So I read Victorian novels, Victorian poetry, but also Victorian scientific literature, medical literature. I mean, I was reading Charles Darwin and Henry Morton Stanley and Herschel and Sigmund Freud, all these people. And I just became sort of immersed in the period. And then when it came time for me to write my dissertation, I thought what I'd really like to do is write about trauma and injury. Um, And keep in mind, this is sort of like the late 90s everybody was sort of talking about PTSD and trauma. It was sort of in the air and I was interested in it. And one of the things that fascinated me was that um, back in the 1850s, there were all these railway crashes and people, people like Charles Dickens crawling out of railway crashes, seemingly okay. But then the next day they get up and they are shaking so they can't sign their name and they develop tremors and memory losses and loss of hearing and they lose their words and they have nightmares. And we would call this PTSD, but yeah. they didn't know what to call it back then. So they called it railway spine. Um, <laughs> so that so that people could go and sue the railway companies, you know, these wealthy railway companies mm-hmm. for damages. Wow. Um, because you couldn't you couldn't sue just for nerves or distress. You had to have an organ that was, you know, problem problematic. Anyway, and so, you know, really this is the first time ever that medical men and legal men get together in a courtyard and a court courtroom and duke it out about injuries and what counts as an injury and what you get paid and what 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 counts as malingering and what counts as real and all this stuff. And I was fascinated by this. So I spent three years obsessing about Victorian railway disasters and injuries. And then um, we moved to Arizona. Well, actually we moved to Milwaukee. I had my daughter. Then we moved back to New York. Then we moved out to Arizona. I did a lot of bouncing. And but somewhere around 2006, when I had my two kids at home, I decided I wanted to write a book. But what did I know about? What could I, what could I write about? You know, write what you know. And so I wrote, um, I wrote about a railway disaster. I put Lady Elizabeth Fraser and her poor laudanum addicted mother on a train in 1874 London and ran it off the rails and chaos and mystery and murder and romance. And so, yeah. so yeah, so that went that way. But your came. books are all mysteries too. They oh, are. Cool. It is a mystery. It is a mystery. It's um, you know, and and what 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 you come to find out, um, and it's, this isn't giving a whole lot away, is that the train crash was a sabotage. Someone is trying to ruin one railway in order to promote another, and is shorting the stock and making money on it. And because these were all joint stock companies, they were all publicly held, really, you know, and mm-hmm. um, so. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a, it's a sort of a stock scheme thing that, that, that happens. That's so, cool. but that's how I ended up getting into 19th century. And then I just kind of stayed there for 18, stayed in 1870s London for all the rest of my books. 
That's great. I, I mean, yeah. and so clearly, you know it, you do it so well. Mm -hmm. um, Under a Veiled Moon is the second Detective Coravan mm -hmm. mystery, and he mm -hmm. is an inspector for the Scotland Yard, um, mm -hmm. born in Ireland. Um, tell us a little bit about this detective. Oh, so I've got a little bit of a crush on him. Um, that's the great thing about being a novelist, right? Like you can invent the people you want to, you know, you yeah. hang out with. Um, so, yeah. So one thing to understand is that in the 1860s and 70s, when Michael Corvin is growing up in Whitechapel, um, which is uh, the same area that the Jack the Ripper murders happened in in the 1880s, it's not the nicest section of town. Anyway, he's growing up there in the Irish part of Whitechapel. And one thing I didn't realize until I really started investigating is the amount of discrimination. I mean, virulent, nasty, horrifying discrimination that the Irish faced after the um, the potato famine, when so many people were either fleeing to America and Canada on those coffin ships or coming over to Liverpool and then down to London. So Michael's, um, so Michael Corbin is going to be up against that, but his father was originally a silversmith. And then when he gets to London, he can't get work because he's Irish. And so he turns to counterfeiting. Mm -hmm. But counterfeiting is dangerous. And he dies in an explosion when Michael is three. So then his mother um, does what she can to, you know, sort of keep and you know, keep things mm -hmm. going. And um, and then she vanishes when he is 12. And he becomes an orphan. And so he joins a thieving gang. Um, he becomes a star glazer, which is um, somebody who uses their knife to break into um, shop windows. And uh, and he eventually becomes adopted by the Doyle family. And one of the boys in the Doyle family and Pat, named Pat, he and Michael become best friends. They join the docks. I mean, they, they work in the docks. They become lightermen. Um, and because he's Irish, he is he's not allowed to use the carts that mm -hmm. people use to push things around the wharfs, like the big barrels and sacks of flour or sugar or salt or coffee or tea or whatever they're carrying. So a lot of the Irish workers would carry it on their back. Well, you get to be really strong, really fast if you have to do that. So he, I mean, at age, you know, 18, Corvin is, is strong. He's quick with his hands. And there's this evil man named O'Hagan who comes looking for bare knuckles boxers. And so he offers Michael Corvin a job. And so Corvin starts fighting for him and he's winning all of his matches. And then one night O'Hagan says to him, you need, you need to throw a match. You know, Corvin's a 19 year old kid. And he's like, yeah. why? You know, I, I'm winning. And he said, yeah, I'm not making any money on you. And that's this really pivotal moment for Corvin because he realizes he thought that O'Hagan was really proud of him for winning all his matches. And he yeah. realized he's basically just an animal for hire. Yeah. Anyway, he goes into the ring. He decides, okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to throw the match because I need the money. The Doyles need the money and he can't do it. He's run out of Whitechapel and he, you know, he crosses the river, both literally and metaphorically. He goes, he crosses the Thames, goes down to Lambeth, gets a job as a constable, a uniformed constable, where all of his skills, his street smarts, his thieving knowledge, his, you know, he's, he's good with his fists. He's strong. He's capable. He can read. Um, so all those things come in handy. And then when we meet him in 1878, He's an inspector at Scotland Yard with a long history of stuff behind him. Is a lot of that history, uh, I mean, some of it came up in this book. Is mm -hmm. more of that it shown in the book, the f first book? In the first one, Down a Dark River, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I recap a little bit in Under Veiled Moon, but that's always like a tricky thing when, yeah. you know, when you have a series. You don't want to repeat a bunch of stuff that people who read the first one and now they're moving right. on to the second one, they're like, oh God, I'm reading the same thing over again. So you, yeah. you kind of you kind of thread it in there a little bit. Right. But, yeah, but I feel like, yeah, you have to it. like touch on it either to yes. remind people or to right. let new readers know what's right. going on. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. <clears throat> um, in your bio, you mentioned that um, your curiosity with the Victorian era accidents and tragedies um, is that was a lot of your in inspiration, right? Well, mm -hmm. like you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and so can you tell us about the incident that propels this novel forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know. Actually, somebody pointed out to me once, like, you started with train wrecks and now you're doing shipwrecks. Like, what's with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> So the real the, the real um, event, um, it, here's a book about it, The Princess Alice Disaster. Um, I didn't know it until I started really investigating the river for Down a Dark River. The Thames is tidal. 
but tidal in a big way for 100 yards inland or 100 miles inland. I mean, way past London um, from the North Sea. So twice a day you have the tide switching back and forth. Right. And sometimes you have changes in height for up to 20 or 25 feet. Wow. Which is which is a lot. Right. Yeah. And you've got r- river. Anyway, you've got it, it, it's, a, it's a very um, energetic environment. It's not still. Mm-hmm. And so anyway, and so the other thing I didn't know was that you have these little steamships that would make day trips, like little, um, almost like our hop on hop off buses from London, from Swan Pier, which is right near London Tower, all the way up to the North Sea and back. But you could, you know, for two shillings, you hop on with your family, you know, you hop off, have a picnic, hop back on the next one, you know, travel down to the North Sea, you know, walk on the beach for a little bit, you know, hop on the next, whatever. Anyway, so the night of September 3rd, the Princess Alice, which is one of these little boats, um, is coming around a blind point, a blind curve called Tripka Point on the South Shore in this 900 ton iron hulled coal carrier called Bywell Castle rams into it. And this is kind of like a, a locomotive hitting a baby carriage. Um, the, the little steamer breaks into three pieces, 650 people in the water. Nobody knows who's on the boat. Everyone, nearly everyone drowns. And it is the worst. It's still the worst disaster that London's ever seen um, on the town. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it was really bad. And I mean, and bodies everywhere and, you know, on the South shore, the North shore, up and down, and it took them months to recover. And the water is really cold, right? It's really cold. And think about those women in the crinoline skirts. Yeah. That's like a sponge dragging you straight to the bottom. Right. And and nobody can swim. There's no life preservers to speak of. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, the the Bywell Castle saw what happened and they were throwing life preservers and um, and like lines and and boat, you know, doors. I mean, anything that would float, they were throwing overboard, trying to help these poor people. And they had their whistle going the whole time. So tugboats came, it's kind of a Dunkirk situation. I mean, all these tugboats and little rowboats came, but you know, they could only do so much um, at any, any rate. So, so this was one piece of true history that I thought this is really interesting, partly because what you're seeing here is really the clash between wood, the cottage industries, and the big industrial complex literally colliding with each other. So the symbolic resonance felt really rich and powerful. And then the other thing, as I alluded to earlier, was the anti-Irish feeling. Mm -hmm. And there was an organization called the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which um, in 1867, it actually bombed Clerkenwell Prison. But their idea was that they wanted to pull the Irish members of parliament back out of parliament. So in 1800, when Ireland came under the umbrella, um, all of the Irish members of parliament from Dublin went to London and they were absorbed into the big English parliament. But they were always a minority. Right. And after the, the, the famine, the potato famine was so poorly managed, they had this idea like, like, let us take our members back and go back to Dublin and run our island. Like, mm-hmm. we know what to do here. I mean, you, this, is, this isn't working for us. Um, but the English Parliament would not let them go. Um, and so the Irish Republican Brotherhood said, okay, fine. We will start committing acts of violence until you let us go. So they started bombing. I mean, th- and this really picked up in the 1880s. And, you know, you think about our troubles, you know, the Irish troubles of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. It has its roots all the way back here. But interestingly, there was often a lot of like diatribe in the newspapers and stuff. So what I did was I said, in the wake of this horrible steamship disaster, in my fictional version, the newspapers start saying the Irish Republican Brotherhood caused it. Hmm. So now you've got this whole question of who's to blame for this crash. Now, true history says it was actually an accident. It was because the boats were in the wrong places and going too fast because of the because of the tide that was rushing at the time. But I said, no, I want to have it be this instead, because I want to explore the way that newspapers and their version of social media can stir up a lot of venom, a lot of hate, and it can bring about some really terrible, tragic consequences. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how you um, weave in like the the real story and and then how you just add little details. Yeah. How do you decide what you're going to do to you know, fictionalize something that actually happened? Um, You know, I often find that the more real stuff I can get my hands around, um, the better, because I don't want it, I don't want it to be 
sort of what I imagined or what's apocryphal or what's convenient for a story. Right. I want the facts to kind of drive the story and, right. and, and push me to figure out, okay, well, what would really, what, what would be plausible? Because I don't, I mean, a, a friend of mine, um, uh, Mark, who's another writer, he said, you know, you can't have settings be just window dressing. They, right. The setting actually has to be where the story takes place. And in fact, if you've written it well, the story couldn't take place any other time except yeah. for this particular time. And I, I really like that idea. So I try and take as much specific stuff as I can. You know, the fictional part is when I take something that's that's adjacent historically and then mush them together. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of how I, how I like to do it. Yeah. I, and you talk about in the, at the end of the book, I think you have an afterward that talks mm -hmm. about like, here's the real stuff and here's the mm -hmm. fictional right. stuff, which is right. great too. Um, right. Um, and, and you brought up the, the Irish Republican Brotherhood and, um, at the, there's definitely, there was that feeling of, um, prejudice and people did not like the Irish at all. Um, and the Irish didn't really like being there either. It seemed like, right. Well, it, it, yeah, sometimes I think they found, they found it really challenging because there were so many obstacles put in their way. Right. Um, my question was about um, Corvin's younger brother, who also joined an Irish gang. And um, and then in the public se sector, you know, the fear and hatred of the Irish is growing among the English. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, and it creates a real dilemma for Corvin, right? Um, yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about that and his relationship with his brother. So his his younger brother, Colin, who is now 19, the exact same age that Corvin was when he fled Whitechapel, Colin has gotten involved with the Whitechapel gang um, and he's making some bad decisions. Um, I, I have a I have a 19 year old son myself and and I, I love him dearly. And he's, he's really pretty on top of his game. But sometimes, you know, I think to myself, yeah, your prefrontal cortex isn't quite there yet. Um, so Colin's just, you know, he's just not making good choices and he's gotten himself embroiled in something that he didn't really quite intend to get embroiled in, but he's kind of stepped on that path. And Coravin wants to rescue him. Yeah. But years ago, um, Coravin left suddenly and Colin took it personally. Mm -hmm. And so Colin is not listening to Coravin. And if you know from Down a Dark River, the first book, Corvin likes to rescue people. It makes him feel good. Yeah. And so he's got sort of a rescuing complex. So he he's trying his darndest to rescue Colin and Colin's like, I'm not having any of it. And you know, I know what I'm doing, I'm 19. So I think, you know, for Corvin, the Irish are at once his family and the people that he's trying to rescue a family member from. And he's trying to be a policeman and, you know, he really, the, the, you know, he, the, the two parts of his personality are he's Irish. This is his history. And he's a policeman. He's been a policeman for over 10 years. So he's really struggling to, 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 to put these, to hold these two things in tension and to be part of both groups, but at the same time, step outside and, you know, be somewhat objective, which is ostensibly the ideal of a policeman, right? Like you're supposed right. to find out the truth. You're supposed to step back and look at all the facts, right? Um, and right now he's got pressure from the police saying, hurry up and solve this case. You've got a guy who's Irish who was on the boat. Can't you just accuse him and you know say he did it? And, and yet his Irish friends are saying, why are you even looking at this guy? He didn't do it. And, and so, yeah, yeah he's, he's caught, he, you know, he's... but I think that there's this complexity that, that this idea that the Irish are sort of monolithic and they are not, you know, there are some of them who are part of the IRB and there's some of them who are part of the gangs and some of them who are just, Irish people just trying to raise their family and, you know, be good people. So, and Corvin can kind of see all of that. Yeah. Yeah. He's really, he really is caught in the middle. And um, I think that's really kind of what, uh, what was really fascinating about him, you know, was mm -hmm. that complexity that, you know, um, that he had so many, like, <laughs> what do you call it? Like eggs in different baskets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, you must spend a great deal of time researching the area, even now that you're not, you know, researching that anymore. <laughs> but, you know, um, uh, 
I loved the physical descriptions of like the alleyways and the cellars and the little, just the little things, you know, the, mm -hmm. I don't even know, their clothes, the coins, the, all the tiny little details. Um, so do you rely on your imagination to fill in some of the gaps on that or um, what, do you have a source? So uh, you can kind of see behind me, I've got a lot of books. Um, and, and I, um, oftentimes I will take there. A lot of these books have pictures. Um, like I have this one that I really love. It's called London Stocklands and it's full of pictures. Oh, that's and, cool. you know, early, early on pictures, you know, kind of from the early 1700s. And, um, you know, just so you can picture what the wharves and things look like. And sometimes I'll take Xerox pictures and I'll just put them up on my wall mm -hmm. just so I have them right there. Um, I have uh, one of the things that I will do is actually read, for example, a book by Trollope that's set in 1878. And I will make lists of nouns, you know, Antimacassar. Cigars, um, you know, playing cards, you know, that felt like, you know, handkerchiefs. I mean, and I know it sounds a little odd, but those things are the the the, the material stuff that these yeah. people will put into their pockets or drop or you know lift or hand from one person to another or just look at. Yeah. And so I I, it's kind of a combination of you know I really rely on the illustrations, but I also like to read things literally written by, for example, Anthony Trollope in 1878. He's in that world. He's riding trains. He's a, he's a post office master. And what's he seeing, you know, right. and, and, and he, and so you can kind of go, you know, you can kind of for historical fiction, you can go back and read a book that is written at that moment Accounts. and get, and get some of that, some of that stuff. And also like the language turns of phrase, a lot of times, um, like before I started, you know, because I'm not, because I am not, in fact, Irish in a 31-year-old Scotland Yard, you know, former thief and bare knuckles boxer, <laughs> um, in order to kind of get that language into my head. Um, so Sir Howard Vincent, who is actually one of the characters in my book, he was a real person. Mm -hmm. He was the director of Scotland Yard. He's the one that kept it open in 1878 when Parliament wanted to close it down for corruption. And he wrote a procedure manual, oh. a police procedure manual that's like 300 pages long. And so before I would write each day, I would read a page out loud and get it in my ear, that yeah. language that because it, it, it was it was written in 18 in the 1870s. And so I would I would read it out loud. And so I would have like the police lexicon and 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 the way that Sir Howard Vincent wrote and spoke and what he talked about in my ear. And then I would start to write because it helped cool. me make the transition into a male. And because I wanted I didn't want it to be a. Uh, of, of, you know, to have Corbin sounding like a woman wrote him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I wanted him to sound like genuinely like, you know, I'm a guy. Well, <laughs> and and also, also the language yeah. is so different. Yeah. 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 So like, you, you know, like you might, you know, it's like pickpockets. Like that was a term that they used truncheon. They used truncheon. They didn't use um, bully I, to, I looked that yeah. one up. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So that, but that's what they called it, and and so you know you want to have that in your head, you know, to to just kind of drop in there as something that he lays his hand on once in a while, right? Yeah, yeah. I I I did. I actually looked that one up because I was like, <laughs> what the heck is that? And I asked What's my that? husband, and he didn't know either. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a wooden. It's a wooden stick. It's about this big. Yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. so cool. Um, so. How do you recommend that other historical fiction authors get the details right? Oh, you know, I has I I am still learning how to do this myself, so I kind of hesitate to offer the advice. But I mean, I I would say that you know some of the big things are getting you know getting the good solid secondary sources. I mean, like I said, I mean I have so many of these. I have Kings of London. I have The Blackest Streets. I have you know. Victorian Babylon <laughs> like I mean I've, I have this book after book um, of things and you know I, I have little red tabs on all these things you know for right. stuff that I thought was really helpful um, I do think that reading um, things like books that are written in the period out loud makes a huge difference for me I can't just do it by just reading it I have to actually speak the words hear them to hear it yeah. yeah. And get them in my ear before I, before I start writing. I mean, those are really, those are really the big things. I mean, I certainly do a lot of research online and, 
And I, I do go, I, you know, I've been to a lot of conferences where people talk about uh, their period, uh, the Historical Novel Society Conference, but also, you know, Bautrican, Left Coast Crime. There's always historical panels. And I love yeah. listening to how people find their stuff. I have some friends who are devoted to newspapers. They like the ads in the newspapers. They like the personal ads. They like the, you know, the advertisements for, you know, lost woman, you know, age 33 kind of thing. And, you know, that's all good. It's all good material. Yeah. Yeah. You know? That's really cool. Um, so it, do you spend a lot of time in libraries too? I, you know, I used to more. Um, yeah. I, 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 you know, much to my husband's chagrin, I've basically built one here. <laughs> I mean, I really do have like as many books as I can possibly, you know, probably manage. But, um, you know, I, when I was first starting, when I was working on my dissertation, I spent six, six or seven weeks over in London. And I was at the yeah. British Library and the Wellcome Library, the medical library, um, looking at um, you know medical treatises about railway disasters and that kind of thing. And I was doing a lot of that really primary research, you know, the stuff that you can't, you, you really just have to, you know, because the books are from the 1800s, you can't take right. them out. So you just sit there on these at these big wooden tables with a little green lamp. Yeah, you know, they had those like green light. Yeah, yeah. And I would just sit there and I would read like you know concussion of the spine. I mean, <laughs> this is what I was reading. So. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I, and I, and I like libraries. Um, yeah. Although you, yeah. So. <laughs> so what's next for Michael Coravan? Well, right now, nothing yet. Um, I have the paperback version of Down the Dark River is coming out in February, which I'm really excited mm -hmm. about because I mean, some people just don't like the hard covers. They want that, want that trade paperback that they can you know, throw yes. in the bag and it's also less expensive. So, so that's, that's exciting. Um, but uh, my publisher, Crooked Lane, has not given me um, the go ahead to write number three. So I've, I know it's a, it's a bummer because I have a great idea. Yeah. Uh, all about an all woman thieving gang. Um, in Whitechapel but you know that there's yeah. that but I decided I would kind of pivot and and I would uh, write something different so mm -hmm. I went back to a story that I had kind of developed I don't know maybe four or five years ago I'd written like a like a first version of it and then kind of put it on the back burner because Corvin got picked up and I did those two books and then I went back to it and I was like ah, I don't know if this is any good and then I reread it and I thought you know there's there's some good stuff here the bones mm -hmm. need to be kind of moved around a little bit and there needs to be some other things added, but this is, this is interesting. So, yeah. um, you know, yeah. So I've, I've got, I've got this book. I, I, I actually just submitted it to my agent about two weeks ago. So we'll see if he can find, you know, someone interested in it. That's cool. I mean, that's yeah. a hard thing for authors to do, but I think people are having to do that more often is mm -hmm. to make that pivot, make the choice yep. to pivot. Yep. Um, I mean, I think I've heard of other authors in your situation who have just decided to go ahead and self-publish the rest of their series because that's what mm -hmm. they really want to write. Mm -hmm. um, but so I don't know, how do you, um, I mean, I think it has to be a personal choice, right? Mm -hmm. How you're going to make that pivot. Um, mm -hmm. any, any advice for authors who maybe need to make a choice like that, that what would you say to them? Uh, I would, I would say, first of all, I guess, sort of feel the feels because it was disappointing. It really was, yeah. you know, I, I was, I was bummed. I, I thought I, I really love Corvin. I love Belinda. I love, you know, Harry Lish. I like, I like Sir Howard Vincent. I like all these characters. I like Gordon Stiles. Um, so I, I just felt, I felt disappointed, but I also felt like, you know, maybe I'll come back to it at some point. I mean, it's not like mm -hmm. they're going anywhere. Um, but I, I kind of dug around for, okay, what am I feeling like writing about right now? And one of the things I wanted to write about sort of philosophically, and that, that governs my ideas too, because I mean, like Donna Duck River came, became, you know, came about because I was interested in writing about failures of empathy. Like what happens when you don't get justice and people are cruel and, and, and don't hear your story and revenge. That's what I wanted to write about. So that that was down a dark river, you know. So like, I mean, and and I wanted to talk about, you know, in 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 under a veiled moon. I was really interested in how we have this fallacy, I think, as human beings, to think, well, if I hear it three or four places, it must be true. Mm -hmm. It's completely false. Like this is a this is an assumption we have, and maybe right. we'd like to believe it. You know, kind of like circumstantial evidence. You know, if you put all the pieces together and it all adds up, it's probably true. This is not true. 
Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about about that. You know, the the you know, I have some bigger concerns with my books than just kind of like you know, well, who who you know, who murdered who kind of thing. And this this book that I that I just handed into my agent, what I wanted to write about was the problem of true stories. That every true story is really a fiction in one way or another. So in in my book, I have a woman who's a novelist. And she's got this uh, old, her oldest friend from childhood is named Lewis. And he is a brilliant political economist. He's all, he's what we would probably call on the spectrum, you know, that kind of brilliant. Yeah. Um, the Victorians called him eccentric. Anyway, he goes in 1871, he goes to Africa with Henry Morton Stanley. It's the famous Dr. Livingstone, I presume, tour. And Henry Morton Stanley comes back with one kind of book, you know, sort of like Africa's fabulous and the natives are wonderful and everyone loves me. and and Lewis comes back with a story about slaves in ivory that nobody wants to hear. Mm. Now they lived together in a tent together for a year and they wrote totally different kinds of books. Right. And, and, but they're both, they're both true, you know, but they're, they're just very different perspectives. And, and I think that that, I think that's what I want to, that's what I wanted to write about. And so once I found that, I thought, okay, I can set aside Corbin. I've got this other book over here that I want to work on and, and let myself just fall in love with it. Yeah, you know, and and but I think a lot of times I I need that larger idea in order yeah. to keep to keep my enthusiasm up past like the third chapter, right? If that makes sense. Yeah. So I, I guess I would just you know look for that big idea that you really want to write about and then head in that direction. Yeah, and like, and and I'm asking too because I had written a sequel to Best Kept Secrets, mm-hmm. and which was also declined by my publisher and um. And, you know, it was heartbreaking, but I feel like there's nuggets from that story. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. it could be rewritten in a different way. Yeah. I could yeah. change the main character, um, you know, and besides that was like three years ago. I know I'm a better writer now. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's a lot of different ways that I can take that manuscript and and I don't have to, you know, try and self-publish it. Yeah. And I, I don't think any writing we do is ever wasted. Like even yeah. some short stories that I've worked on that kind of got like three quarters of the way done, but I was like, yeah, they didn't ever quite like gel. I, I was never happy with them. I never sent them out anywhere, but I, you know, I kind of come back to them like, oh, that little piece right there. I can, yep. I can use that. Yeah. So, or the characters you know. for me, it's the mm-hmm. characters mm-hmm. too. And yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love these characters. Yeah. I, I want them to be in a book somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think that's, I think, I think that's very true that there have been characters that I've developed off page that then make their way in. And in a way, because I make, I, they're, they're not coming from in, inside the novel. They're coming from outside. They're stronger. Yeah. They're more interesting to me. They cause more trouble when I bring them into the novel. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, doesn't, doesn't that work? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, so what is your biggest inspiration? Who are your favorite authors? Oh, um, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, I, I, a lot of the, a lot of the authors that I really love um, are, outside of the mystery genre. Some of them are inside. Like I love Tana French and Steph Penny's um, Tenderness of Wolves is, I still go back and reread it every couple of years. I mm-hmm. think it's brilliant. Um, I love Emma Tulls. I love, um, but I, I mean, I also love Charles Dickens. I mean, Great Expectations is still one of my favorite novels. I've taught it several times. I love it. And um, Peter Carey, Margaret Atwood, uh, Anne Patchett, um, Louise Erdrich, um I, yeah, there's, 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 there's so many, uh, yeah. there's so many good ones that I, you know, I've been reading this past year. Um, but you know, I, if someone asked me once, why mystery, you know, like, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of, it's, you know, right. And, and it's funny because, so I'm going to tell you a story that is, that has to do with my, a misadventure in my grandmother's library. So, um, I grew up in Rochester, New York and every Sunday, pretty much we would drive from our house, like 20, 25 minutes out to Bergen, which is where my grandparents lived out in the middle of this it was in the sticks. It was very, very far out in the middle of these pine forests. And I would usually bring a book. My parents would go off and play bridge. My brother and all the cousins would go out and play in the woods. And I would sit in my grandmother's library. And she had one of these um, 70s recliners that would tip, you know, those, okay, it's covered in like fake gold fur. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, <laughs> you can picture it, right? Yeah. Anyway, so so one day, I don't know whether I forgot my book or I finished my book that I brought or whatever. Anyway, so I'm in my grandmother's library and it's floor to ceiling books. And I saw this one shelf that had lots of bright covers, right? So I was like, well, that looks interesting. So I pull one down. And it's got gold on the front cover, like gold writing and swirly letters and a very beautiful girl with long flowing hair and a gorgeous dress. And there's this man who had lost his shirt somewhere. <laughs> I was so intrigued. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm sitting there. I mean, I'm like 11, right? So I'm, I've discovered my grandmother, my very like religious spiritual grandmother, her stash of bodice strippers. So I'm sitting there in the, in the, in the gold like chair and I'm reading you can picture this and my grandmother walks by there's no door on the library so my grandmother walks by on the way to the kitchen to like you know fix dinner or whatever and she sees me reading whatever it was you know the duke's delight or whatever anyway so she kind of bustles in and takes the book out of my hands and says here honey why don't you go read these and so she steered me toward a shelf that had Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca Jamaica Inn Phyllis Whitney Mary Stewart Victoria Holt and and there were two shelves of these and I would read one a week, right? So I'd wow. get there, pull one down, I'd start reading it. I was allowed to take it home with me if I brought it back and then I could get a new one, right? So, yeah. but I did this for, for weeks, months even, you know, and I just, I, and I think that those books with their um, exotic locales, Gothic elements, murder, mystery, yeah, definite focus on a, on a strong woman heroine with relationships and people she loved yeah. Um, and they were well written. I mean, you read even now you read Mary Stewart and, and she's got some beautiful sentences. Um, so I think that that just sort of laid down tracks in my brain that I don't know, for, certainly for my first three books with all yeah. that all have the young women protagonists thrown into a situation. They are definitely following that trajectory. Yeah, no, I love it. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. Um, well, if this has been really great talking to you and, um, I want to know where can readers find you and your books and how can they connect with you? Oh, I, and I love connecting with readers. And I, I, um, so I have a website. It's just my name. It's www.karen, K-A-R-E-N, Odin, O-D-D-E-N, it's two D's, um, dot com. And there's a contact button there and you can just hit the contact button and, and it'll, you know, anything will come right to me. And the information there, I have my historical, I have a blog with all kinds of historical fun tidbits and everything about the Victorian era. Um, I have all of my old newsletters. I have a newsletter that comes out every six weeks that always features another woman author doing mm -hmm. an essay and a giveaway. And then I always, it has writing tips and workshops and, you know, all kinds of other stuff. Um, this past one, I actually wrote about my high school reunion because I went to my 40th reunion. It's the first time I've ever gone to a high school reunion. And that was a little weird and cool, but, <laughs> but kind of odd. Um, Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, so like have all that stuff is on my website. Again, it's www.karenodin.com. And I have, um, and also there you can connect with me on, I'm on threads. And I think I just, I just got on Blue Sky. I'm just trying that out. Um, but Facebook and Twitter and, you know, yeah. Instagram and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, and then, and then for people who are local here in Phoenix, I am actually going to be starting to do some writing workshops through one of the libraries there'll be more information about that on my website too oh that's great that's wonderful so, yeah and bookstores everywhere bookstores or... uh, yeah I, yeah um it, it, everywhere i mean it's on i mean basically on on yeah. the big a the amazon um but yeah <laughs> I, I mean barnes and noble um a, a lot of indies carry it um and libraries and one of the things i wanted to point out someone said to me is it okay if i read your book you know at the library and i'm like absolutely yeah uh, something that i didn't know and i found out through um a librarian event was that first of all most libraries have slush funds so you can always request a book mm -hmm. and they will usually buy it for you and second if you take a book out of a library that keeps the book on the shelf. Mm. So, cause they have like a rotation system. So like if a book doesn't get taken out for a few years, they pitch it. So you can help a, help an author that you like, you know, by taking their book out once in a while and, you know, which are taking out some of their books and that helps keep their book on the shelf. So that is great advice. It's a good news, right? It's good news for yes. us, right? Yeah. 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 Keep, keep yeah. those books in circulation. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Karen. This has been great. It's been lots of fun. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate yeah. you um, letting me come and chat. <laughs> yeah, it's no, great. it's been great. All right. Thanks so much. Okay. Take care.